Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, Combating Loneliness and Social Isolation for the Older Adults in the Nordic Countries. And older adults is the term we're going to use here today, eldrevuxna in Swedish. And this webinar is arranged by the Nordic Welfare Center, which is an institution in the Nordic Council of Ministers, Health and Social Sector. And my name is Jens Berry, and I have the big honor to serve as your moderator here this afternoon. And I'm sitting in, in Finland, in the Helsinki region, and I'm so happy to see so many names dropping in here on my screen. We are more than 140 people from different parts of the world taking part in this webinar. Wow. I thought we could start with uh, a small poll to get a feeling of, of whom we are here to, today, to get to know each other a little bit better. And the poll is what country and or what region are you from? Please fill it, fill it in. You see, you see the poll here on, on the screen. And before we start, uh, I just want to remind you of a, of a couple of, of things. This webinar, it's going to be recorded and it will be published on Nordic Welfare Center's YouTube channel. We will edit it for a, for a little bit. So that means it will take some time before it's uh, uploaded. And you will also get all the presentations that we will see and hear today. They will be distributed to you after this webinar. And please ask us questions. Give us comments, share thoughts, and you can do that in the chat function. You can see it down on the, on the toolbar. We also have two sessions of questions to the speakers today. My colleague and friend Jessica Gustafsson is keeping an eye on the chat function and on the, the questions, and she will help me to, uh, with them later on this afternoon. Written interpretation is also available. You can find it by activating and clicking on the CC. You see it on the, on the toolbar closed caption function here on the, on the toolbar. And we would also like to inform you that it's not uh, it's, it's not possible for you to uh, turn on your own video or sound microphone during this webinar. I hope that it's fine for you. It's due to, to technical reasons. And if you have any technical questions or problems, please write to us in the chat. We have a real great technical staff helping us out. So I think enough has been said now about practical issues. Let's start with today's topic. The main questions here today are, what do we know about loneliness and social isolation among older adults in the Nordic countries? And what are the consequences of involuntary loneliness? And what does the latest research in this area tell us? We will today have here some of the leading researchers in the Nordic region. We will hear them give their views on these very crucial matters. And now first, I will virtually hand over the microphone and the screen to one of the organizers, Ayla Matta. She's a senior advisor from the Nordic Welfare Center in, Swedish, in Sweden. Please, Ayla, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Yes, I hope that you can hear me. Hi, everybody. Um, as uh, the next slide, please. Uh, as uh, Jens told uh, you, uh, Nordic Welfare Center is arranging this webinar today, and I'm going to tell you some words about uh, us. Uh, uh, our mission is to contribute uh, to the development of welfare initiatives in the Nordic region. Next slide, please. And we are doing that by compiling and dissemination knowledge on welfare issues. For example, we arrange seminars and conferences, and we work with uh, different expert groups and meetings. And uh, of course, we are working also with our Nordic networks. We also produce best practice recommendations to our decision makers, which are one of our target groups. Uh, we can say that we build uh, bridges between research and practice. Next slide, please. 
next. Uh, uh, here you can see our focus areas and they are welfare policy, disability issues, integration and public health. And next, please. And uh, I tell you something about the project I am leading. And it's about active and healthy aging in the Nordic region. We are coordinating the Nordic network of age-friendly cities and communities. And those cities are members of uh, World Health Organization Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. And uh, those cities used to meet a couple of times every year and exchange knowledge and experience with each other. We also highlight uh, so-called AIDS integrated meeting places and uh, we do it because we in a purpose that uh, that it's very important that both children young people families and the older adults can meet each other in their everyday lives and in in that way uh, help each other and uh, and that also make the older adults feel less lonely and increase their likelihood that they will stay healthy longer. We also work with welfare technology and how to promote active and healthy aging with welfare technology. Uh, the Nordic Welfare Center works with several projects in this field. And the fourth one is why we are here today. We work, work with Nordic expert group uh, of loneliness and social isolation and members of that group is going to present the latest Nordic uh, research and interventions. We are also launching today a new report that descri describes uh, strategies and visions for healthy aging in the Nordic countries and you can find that report on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Ayla, and also thank you for, uh, I know you have made so much work for to, to arrange this webinar, so, so thanks, thanks Ayla, Ayla, to you already. And we will now move on to a new Nordic research overview. This report, it's in Swedish, was published uh, by the Nordic Council of Ministers in August this year. And the report is about loneliness among older adults in the Nordic countries. It will now be presented by Associate Professor Lena Dahlberg from Dalarna University and sociologist Karin Lennartsson from Karolinska Institute. Please go ahead. Thank you. And thanks for inviting us to present at this seminar. We really look forward to that. Um, so as um, Jan said, we're going to present uh, findings from a project that we did for the Nordic Council of Ministers. Um, so that's a report that is published and available on their website. Uh, and uh, once we presented this, we're also going to make a very brief reflection on COVID-19. I think it's difficult not to um, at least mention that in this context, because loneliness is, of course, very central to, to the pandemic. So I assume that uh, all of you who, who participate in this seminar have an interest in loneliness and in, in older adults. Uh, but even so, I think it can be quite good to define a few terms in the beginning of the, the webinar, because um, that will avoid confusion and will make it clear what we mean when we talk about loneliness. Uh, there are terms referring both to the objective states and subjective experiences uh, of social, social matters. And um, social isolation is an example of a more ob objective state. It refers to being alone or having few in, or infrequent social contacts. Um, sometimes when you read articles in media, you can say that or people in the Nordic countries are very lonely or they experience loneliness at a high level. But when you start reading a bit closer, it could actually be about living alone, which doesn't necessarily have to do with loneliness. It's a household composition. And then you have more subjective experience of being alone, which can be both positive or neutral or negative. So people can enjoy being alone or in solitude um, while listening to music or going for a walk in, in the forest or, or whatever. Um, 
However, when we talk about loneliness in research, uh, we refer to a negative feeling of being alone uh, or feeling lonely. And that is sometimes also in media referred to involuntary loneliness. In research, this has often been um, defined as um, a discrepancy between one's desired and achieved levels of social relations resulting in this feeling of loneliness. And this discrepancy may have to do with how often you meet people, how many social contacts you have, or the, the quality of the contacts, the uh, intimacy, can you trust people? It has also been suggested that loneliness has an um, emotional and a, a social dimension. And emotional loneliness um, refers to a lack of having someone that you really trust, someone really close and intimate attachment. Um, whereas social loneliness is a response to the absence of having a, a group that you belong to, um, a, co a coherent community, for example. And this difference between emotional and social loneliness it makes it possible to understand why people sometimes can experience loneliness while they're in a group of people. An awareness of this dimensions of loneliness, I think, is also very useful if, if you work with intervention or try to reduce loneliness, because a different intervention may not be suitable for both dimensions of loneliness. For example, a person who is experiencing emotional loneliness may not necessarily benefit for going, going to a group intervention or a group activity, whereas that's, that can be very appropriate for someone who is experiencing uh, social loneliness. So the main focus of our presentation today is this report, which we have recently um, completed. It was published in August and it's Karin um, and myself who have taken the main responsibility for the report and Amanda Frank, Kevin McKee, Mavish Nasir and Johan Drenberg have contributed to different chapters. And as I said, this is available on the website of the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, the report has five chapters. In the first chapter, we give a very brief background to the project and to loneliness. Uh, we define um, key terms and so on. In the second chapter, we um, summarize uh, previous research on the consequences of loneliness in terms of health and mortality. The third chapter presents the finding of a systematic review that we have done on risk factors for loneliness. Um, so who, who, which group of older people or older adults um, have a higher risk of experiencing loneliness. Uh, we have also done some analysis of the prevalence and risk factors for loneliness in the Nordic countries, and that's presented in chapter four, and the analysis is based on European social survey data. And in the final chapter, we've done, we present the findings of an overview of interventions to reduce loneliness in the Nordic countries. So if we start then with the consequences of loneliness. Um, when we've gone through previous research, we see that there are associations between loneliness and mortality. So there is a risk of dying um, earlier if you experience loneliness. Uh, there's also associations with poor health. And uh, the associations are particularly strong when it comes to depression, when it comes to cardiovascular diseases such as stroke, and when it comes to dementia and cognitive impairment. Uh, Having said, said this, there are some issues that need to be considered when you're trying to draw a conclusion based on previous research. Uh, firstly, the direction of the association is sometimes unclear. What is the cause and what is the effect? Uh, while loneliness may increase the risk of poor health, we know that poor health also may increase the risk of loneliness. So a problem in this respect is that a lot of previous research is based on cross-sectional studies. That means that there's a, a snapshot of the situation. You measured something at one point in time rather than following it up over time. Another problem is that the analysis methods are often inadequate to determine cause and effect. We also know that there are few studies that look at consequences of loneliness specifically for older adults. 
and when older adults are included in, in broader studies on the whole population, there are rarely separate analyses for this age group. And the final problem is that studies don't always separate effects uh, of loneliness and other social aspects of social relations, for example, social support. So sometimes this is a little bit blurred. Uh, we did a systematic review of uh, risk factors uh, among older adults, risk factors for loneliness. And in this review, we focused on longitudinal uh, studies. So it's studies that followed individuals over time. So they have at least one follow-up um, measurement. Uh, we identified 47 relevant articles and 34 of them had good enough quality to be included in this review. So we made a quality assessment. And uh, one observation is that more than half of these articles were published in the last few years. So this is a rapidly growing field of research. There is a dominance uh, of articles from a few countries, particularly the Netherlands and the United States, followed by United Kingdom and Sweden. Um, one article included international data, and that was based on only data from two countries, Belgium and Netherlands. Around half the article based on national data, and the rest was based on either regional or local samples. Uh, I know that after we completed the review, there have been a few more uh, international studies, so we have something to look forward to there. That there are some in the pipeline. Um, the 34 articles that we included in the review examined a total of 21 unique risk factors of loneliness. And when I say unique risk factors, that means factors and not measurements. So a fact, if a factor is measured in various different ways, we still only counted it once. Um, but this also means that many factors were only included in one or a few articles. Uh, and quite often the results were mixed. So uh, in total, this means that for the most factors, the evidence is not particularly strong. Uh, we looked at five, we grouped these factors into five groups, where we looked at uh, demographics, uh, social factors, socioeconomical factors, health factors, and mental health and psychological factors. Uh, when it comes to demographics, uh, there is quite strong evidence that being a woman and being of higher age among older adults uh, increases the risk of loneliness. But there's also very clear that this is primarily around bivariate associations. So associations that only look at being a woman and feeling uh, loneliness or being of high age and loneliness. Once you put other uh, factors into the models, you'd control for other factors, these associations tend to be insignificant. So this means that the association um, has less to do with being a woman and high age itself, and rather with conditions that comes with gender and age. So for example, we know that women and people of higher age often lose their partner before uh, men and people of younger age, and they're all more often also of poorer health. Social factors are fairly well researched um, and it has been repeatedly been found that being married or partnered uh, is protective. So you have a lower risk of loneliness. Whereas if you're a widow, widower, you have a higher risk of loneliness. Having social contacts, a social network, having social support is also, are also protective of loneliness. Uh, there's less research on socioeconomical factors um, and the evidence is not conclusive, but there are some research that suggests that having poorer financial conditions increases the risk of loneliness. When it comes to health, the evidence is strongest regarding self-rated health and functional ability. Self-rated health is often measured by a, a single questions where you ask people to rate their general health. And functional ability is the ability to perform activities in your daily life. Um, 
mental health and psychological factors include quite a broad uh, set of factors. And many of these were only included in one or a few studies. Uh, so where there is a bit more evidence is when it comes to depression um, and depressed mood. So depression and an increase in depression increases the risk of loneliness. So even though there's been a broad set of factors that have been looked at as risk factors for loneliness, there are some evident gaps in the literature. So for example, there are a few articles have looked at uh, living in care homes as a risk factor for loneliness, but no articles have looked at receipts of home help or any other aspects of care. There are also very few articles that consider life course factors such as childhood condition or working life and so on. And there were very little on macro level factors, for example, how the welfare system is organized. And one explanation for that could be that there are so little done internationally, so there's very little comparative research in this area. So I'm not now going to hand over to Karin to present our findings based on European Social Survey. Okay, the um, aim was to study the prevalence then among all the people in Nordic countries and to investigate the association between several risk factors and loneliness. To do this, we use the European Social Survey, which Lena earlier mentioned. And very shortly, this uh, I can tell you that this is an academically driven cross-national survey that has been conducted across Europe since two, 2001. And every second year, face-to-face -face interviews are done with newly recruited and selected uh, cross-national samples of people 15 years and older. And ESS include measures, for instance, on attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And to date, 38 eight nations are included. Since the question about loneliness um, is included in the interview ways 2006, 10, 12, and 14, we use data from these years. And loneliness is measured with one question, and you can uh, change. Thank you, Lena. And uh, it's on how much time during the last week the respondent had felt lonely. And as you can see, there were four response uh, categories and we um, take together those who have sometimes of some of the time, most of the time and almost all of the time, these people who answer that questions are considered to be lonely. And we use data from Denmark, Finland, Iceland, and Norway and Sweden, and only people aged 60 years and older. Our first question was, are loneliness more prevalent in the Nordic countries compared to the rest of Europe? And here we have the results. Uh, and we, you can see that the prevalence for every country and also the overall prevalence for loneliness, that's the dark blue line. And the blue lines are the Nordic countries. And notable is that loneliness was most common in the east and southeast of Europe in 2012. And loneliness was relatively low in the Nordic countries compared to the rest of Europe. And the prevalence rates were lowest in Norway, Denmark, and Iceland. And these results follow the findings from previous studies on loneliness in Europe. 
in the Nordic countries, the prevalence of loneliness vary between 16% and 25%. And we can take the next slide, Lena. And this slide shows the prevalence of loneliness across the Nordic countries uh, separately for women and men. And as you can see, in all countries, women report loneliness more often than men. And the prevalence is highest uh, among women in Sweden. And the gender difference are also largest in Sweden, but also in Iceland. We also looked at age differences. And in all countries, loneliness increases with age. In the youngest age group, the prevalence of loneliness is on average 16% and the country uh, differences is fairly low and fairly small, I should say. In the age groups 70 to 79, the average prevalence of loneliness is 23%. The variation across countries are larger and loneliness is more prevalent in Finland and in Sweden compared to the other Nordic countries. In the oldest age group, loneliness is most prevalent and just over 30% report loneliness, sometimes more often the week before the interview. Loneliness in the oldest age group are most frequent in Finland and Sweden, but also in Norway. The next slide, please. There is a common belief that loneliness among older people have increased over time, although several studies have shown no change over time or even a slight decrease. Our results from the five Nordic countries show the same pattern. There is no change over time. However, as you can see, there is a decrease between 2012 and 14 in Finland. And whether this is a downward trend or not, we do not know. To answer that question, we need to update our analysis with data from more current years. The next step was to analyze potential risk factors for loneliness and our Analytic sample consists of nearly 8,000 respondents from the years 2006 to 14. And our bivariate results shows that, that gender is a risk factor for loneliness with women experience more loneliness than men. Loneliness increases with age. We also found that poor health is associated with loneliness and to be excluded from social relation. That is, that is how have few social contacts and lacking social re, uh, support is also associated with loneliness. And we also found that exclusion from civic participation and civic participation is here measured by those who are taking part and vote in the latest election. And those who did not do that, they also reported loneliness to a higher extent than people who did take part in the election and voted. Furthermore, our analysis showed that low material resources and especially the feeling of having, not having enough income was associated with loneliness. That, that is that people who believe that they not have enough income to live on also reported more loneliness or loneliness to a greater extent than those who believe that they manage on their household income. And finally, we also show that, that 
those who did not feel secure in their neighborhood, those, those who were insecure, um, live in an insecure neighborhood, also reported loneliness to a greater extent than those who were feeling safe. So our results indicate that loneliness is not only associated with social relationships, it is also associated with, re with risk factors covering many areas of life. So back to you, Lena. Thank you. So in the final part of this uh, project, we uh, wanted to identify and present different Nordic interventions to reduce loneliness. And the original plan was to um, what we wrote, wrote in the project plan was that we were going to use two previous systematic reviews where one build on another and identify which Nordic interventions were part of that and then do an updated search. This did not generate very uh, many interventions. So we, we changed this and became more ambitious. We went uh, back and did a literature search from year 2000 ourselves up till um, August 2019 when we did the search. We also went through um, quite a large number of previous reviews and overviews of research and we had contacts with researchers in the Nordic countries. Still um, we only managed to identify nine articles on uh, interventions to reduce loneliness published since year 2000. Uh, three of these came from Sweden and six of them came from Finland. Um, having said this, there, I know that there are more interventions going on uh, and there are development projects, uh, but these don't have not resulted in scientific articles. So they might be presented as a, a research report or an evaluation report. So in this part of the study, we only focused on scientific articles and we then found nine of them. The target group for the interventions were primarily persons aged um, 78 years old, um, living in ordinary housing and not needing any help um, for their daily life and being in good condition. Uh, two thirds of the articles presented group-based interventions. And themes uh, of these interventions covered education, psychosocial activities and elective activities. And in education could, for example, concern strategies in, in how you handle problems related to the aging process, or it could be a computer course or training on health issues, for example, how, how you navigate the care system or specific health problems. Psychosocial activities um, concerned sharing experience with other people in similar situations. It could be lectures or cultural activities. And in some interventions, the participant could choose between alternative activities, uh, for example, physical exercise or group discussions or excursions or individual counseling, so more elective activities then. And it should be noted that these uh, themes are not clear cut. There are uh, great overlaps between them. Five articles reported a decrease in loneliness, but it was quite often unclear what aspect of the intervention that contributed to this effect. Uh, for example, it could be unclear if the effect was a result of meeting up with other people or the actual content of the intervention or how it was delivered. So to conclude, in this project, uh, we found is it that there our associations with poor health and mortality as consequences of loneliness. Uh, but that, that uh, and this is based then on, on previous research, but that research, there is a need of more research that have a design that enable conclusion on the direction of association. So what's the cause and effect? We need a clearer focus on loneliness as opposed to other social aspects. And we need to include older adults in this studies. And if it's broader studies, including the whole population, we would like to see more separate analysis for this age group. We also found uh, 
uh, we looked at the risk factors and the evidence is quite strong when it comes to certain risk factors. So not having or losing a partner, having low level of social contacts, low level of social support, poor self-rated health, functional limitations and depression. That's where we have the clearest evidence as risk factors for loneliness. Uh, many potential risk factors were included in a few studies. So we, as I said, we had over 100 risk factors, but many of them were only included in one or a few studies. But there are also risk factors that are not included at all in longitudinal research. And this um, knowledge about risk factors is very important if you want to intervene and identify persons who experience loneliness if you want to develop adequate interventions to reduce loneliness. When we looked at the prevalence and risk factors in the Nordic countries, we found a relatively low and stable prevalence of loneliness amongst older adults in these countries. Another conclusion is that the risk factors cover many areas of life, which Karin told you about. And this means that we need a holistic perspective when we're trying to combat loneliness. We cannot just look at increasing social contacts. We also need to look at the whole life situation, civil participation, material resources, safety in the neighborhood and health. And these are just the factors we look at. There might well be other areas that need to be looked at as well. And when it comes to intervention, Sadly enough, we can conclude that there are very few Nordic articles that present interventions on how to reduce loneliness in older adults. This means that we have very limited knowledge on what works and on what aspects of the intervention that actually contribute to a positive effect. So I'm going to finish off this presentation with a little reflection on COVID-19 um, and loneliness in older adults. Okay, now one minute if it's okay. That's fine, yeah, I we'll just have this slide left. Um, so there have been research uh, on loneliness during the pandemic. Uh, there's been a large number of articles. A lot of these are just editorials or commentaries and don't present any new data, but there are some that present new data. And I would say that my impression is that most of them report an increase in loneliness. Some have reported a stable level. I'm here referring to a Swedish study by Kiwi, uh, but that also included a fairly young group of older people. They were 65 till 71 years old. So that might be an expla explanation to this more stable level. Um, so although um, a lot of research, both amongst older adults, but also the general population points in the same direction. It should be noted that these are quite often based on convenience samples, not random samples, um, quite often on the total population. And they often conducted online, which means that older adults tend to be underrepresented. Uh, and it's re again rare with separate analysis for this age group. And those older participants that do, do take part in these studies are not necessarily representative for the whole population. They are at least very active online. There are exceptions of, of articles which I think have a strong representation of the whole group. A Dutch article by Tilburg and a Swedish article by Kiwi and colleagues. Uh, and the other thing um, is that they, for natural reasons, have quite short follow-up times or no follow-up at all. And that also means that there is little done so far on, on the consequences or interventions in this area. So thank you very much for your attention during this presentation. Thank you, Lena Dalvari, and also a big hand to Karin Lennartson. And I remind you all, we will have questions for Lena and Karin in about 20, 25 minutes. But first, we will now launch a new Nordic survey. It's a survey on strategies for active and healthy aging, including the area of loneliness and social isolation. The survey is carried out by senior planning architect Lina Kumlin at the consultant firm WSP on behalf of the Nordic Welfare Center. And the purpose with this survey is to act as a Nordic knowledge base. Please, Lena. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. 
Uh, I'm working at the Stockholm office at WESP. And um, I'm going to present uh, this report that is an overview uh, of strategies, initiatives, and good examples uh, recording active and health aging um, in the Nordic countries. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, WSP, uh, we are our, uh, a worldwide analyst and technology consulting company re represented in more than 40 countries. And along myself, uh, Emma Bodin and uh, Anna Tenkwit. Tinkvist uh, has also been uh, contributing to this report. So, uh, as Ayla already told you, uh, the Nordic Welfare Center has an assignment from the Nordic Council of Ministers to promote active and healthy aging in the Nordic region. And that is the background to this survey that, uh, as Jens uh, told uh, before, is uh, the, the purpose is to increase the knowledge and uh, of how work within the field of active healthy aging is implemented in the Nordic countries. And the survey investigates national initiatives, visions and strategies. Actors, regional strategies, action plans, and local examples of acti activities and solutions are described. And the survey uh, also describes how the countries follow up their work using indicators and other measures. And uh, we have been looking into four themes. Uh, we have been looking into age-friendly cities and communities, age-integrated housing and meeting places, combating loneliness and social isolation and active and health aging through welfare technology. When it comes to the method, uh, we've been interviewing 20 people on that works on national, regional and local level in all the Nordic countries. We have also done uh, desk research and we have been giving uh, input from the expert group uh, regarding loneliness and social isolation um, for the Nordic Welfare Center. Uh, and here you can see an overview uh, of the actors uh, operating on national, regional and local level. Um, and um, on overall and strategic, uh, overall and strategic work is primarily conducted at the national level, upon which governments, public health, and care authorities cooperate. Uh, all Nordic countries have an elderly council with representatives from different pensioners associations, and here we can also see um, some examples of university universities and colleagues uh, that uh, contribute with research within the field. And when it comes to key findings, uh, we can, uh, when it comes to strategies, uh, we can see that it's only Norway that has a Minister of Elderly and Public Health. The other Nordic countries, uh, their ministers uh, are responsible for elderly issues all, uh, along with several other political areas. The differences between the Nordic countries also apply to the development of national strategies. Norway has an explicit strategy for an age-friendly society, while the other Nordic countries have integrated elderly issues into various parts of policy areas concerning the development of care and welfare, housing, and the labor market. The municipalities that are part of the World Health Organization's global network of age-friendly cities and communities have developed their strategies partly based on the WHO's work. 
we also identify that all the Nordic countries identify social participation as a vital factor for the mental health of the older population. The opportunity for social context, social activities and social relationships with loved ones are stated to be of great importance for a reduced feeling of loneliness. Uh, we have also identified four common themes in the strategies and they are uh, physical and mental health are connected and part of a whole. Participation is the opposite of isolation. Digital solutions will, will play a big role and good health creates a healthy society in general. And when it comes to the theme physical and mental health are connected and a part of a whole, we can see that uh, there is a Finnish strategy that emphasizes that really good physical health does not exist without mental health. The Danish National Board of Health confirms a connection between a person's general state of health and social relations and that people with stronger social relationships are like, less likely to become ill. Finland, Denmark and Norway include physical activity as important for mental well-being. Uh, and nutritious, nutritious food are also described as important for physical health. Reykjavik's uh, policy for an age-friendly city states that good and appetizing food must be available for older adults. When it comes to participation is the opposite of isolation. Uh, we can see several in initiatives to increase the participation of older adults in the society. Uh, we found a good example uh, from Tampere, Finland, uh, where there is a special focus on creating a wider range of act activities in different squares around the city to encourage older adults to spend more time outdoor as well as explore more of the city. Uh, when it comes to the theme, digital solutions will play a big role. Uh, we can see that Sweden and Norway highlight digitalization as an opportunity to increase mental well-being. And in several countries, there are applications and websites aimed especially towards older adults. Both in Denmark and in Finland, there are applications with focus on creating social contacts and easily reach new potential friends. Uh, we can also see good examples uh, where it's possible to book video calls with residents of elderly and service homes in Sweden. And when it comes to the theme, good health creates a healthy society in general. Uh, we can see that Denmark emphasizes how good uh, health among older, older adults benefit both the in individuals but also society as a whole. In Iceland and Finland, uh, there are strategies that specific, specific, specifically mention autonomy as an important factor. And some other uh, examples of good in initiatives uh, is that um, in Iceland and Finland, there are telephone hotlines where you can report uh, older adults uh, that are lonely. We can, we can see that um, in multiple countries, there is volunteers to assist and accompany to activities also uh, when discounts for cultural events and public uh, transport. Uh, we have also seen that Iceland uh, specifically works uh, a lot to increase work positions specifically for older, in the older individuals uh, with a focus on building purpose and participation. And just as Karin and uh, Lena, we've been uh, looking into the COVID-19 factor. 
and we can see that uh, organizations and individual individuals are affected on many levels, uh, primarily on local and region level at this point, and it's still a bit early for natural or strategic shifts. And we can see that uh, a lot uh, of people and organizations are reprioritizing reprioritizing to digital solutions and more resources are put on uh, pre-existing projects. Uh, and interview uh, those people that we've been interviewing um, say that uh, the COVID-19 situation is putting more focus on issues that has always existed, but is now in the public eye. Uh, and hence a big focus on loneliness and social isolation among all older adults. Uh, a risk factor is that uh, with short deadlines, uh, there is a risk excluding the older adults in the participation of developing uh, sustainable and long-term solutions. When it comes to data and measuring, self-assessment is most common, uh, especially for social isolation. Uh, that data used uh, is often uh, connected to health care and assistance. And just as uh, Lena and Karin mentioned, uh, there is this uh, European social survey uh, where the issue of loneliness has been included. Uh, in some of the collect data collections. Some Nordic countries has also general health measurements that include social isolation in all ages, among other topics. Uh, in uh, Finland and Norway, uh, we have the RAI, and in Iceland, we have the core health indicators. And when it comes to obstacles, uh, there is a general lack of proper measuring indications according to the interviews. Some international scales are used uh, and there can be a challenge to adapt these to the needs and conditions of regions or locals. Uh, there are also a challenge to include the most loneliest people uh, since those who withdraw most may be the hardest to reach. And as mentioned before, uh, loneliness and social isolation, isolation are not always interconnected. Um, as Lena mentioned that living in a nursing home does not guarantee not feeling lonely and uh, social isolation may be measured ob objectively. Um, And when it comes to follow-up and evaluation, uh, just like measurement, it's an area where several of the interviewees say that there is a lot of work uh, left. Most countries follow up their statistics annually and see, the, see this as a follow-up. And this is especially visible when it comes to loneliness where it's mentioned that there is not really a sufficiently versatile way to follow up. Uh, we have the active aging index where European countries are compared by how many older people that participate in social activities. Finland has an ongoing work where they develop their quality recommendations regularly and evaluate what has been done since the previous ones. Sweden do follow-ups every year on the topic older adults and welfare technology through Vision eHealth, where there is a longer status description. Norway seems to be the country that has come the furthest when it comes to formulating distinct goals that are followed up. Uh, and this is not uh, this is on, on an overall level, not just when it comes to loneliness and social isolation. And uh, in the interviews, uh, we have uh, uh, identified some themes that could be interesting for future work when it comes to active and healthy aging. 
Uh, hence the fact that more people grow old and more people are healthy for longer. Uh, we need to work with uh, the question regarding ageism and our view of the older population. Uh, we need to foster a more positive view of aging and older adults. Uh, we also need to uh, see older adults and their knowledge as an important re resource and work uh, with the, um, bringing more work opportunities. Um, there also a need to apply a more intersectional pers perspective uh, since the fact that all above 70, of course, not a homogeneous uh, group, other perspectives still apply and create their own needs. Uh, we also need to work more with autonomy and inclusion and uh, how we can involve uh, older adults in questions that require them. So we develop with, not for. And in general, we need to work more with measuring follow-up and evaluation. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lena. Very, very interesting findings you had there in, uh, in, your, in your survey. Now, I think it's time for, for questions. Our first section of, of questions from, from you in the, in the audience. So please, uh, Lena, Karin, Lena, and also Ayla, turn on your, your video and uh, your microphones. And I will hand over to my colleague, Jessica Gustafsson. Jessica, you have watched and followed the, the chat. Do we have any questions? Absolutely, Jens. Tack så mycket. There are a lot of questions and comments, and please keep them coming. It's, it's really nice to follow them. First, we have a general comment from Sweden. Uh, in Sweden, we see that the age group 80 plus are often excluded in many surveys, even in surveys made by the government agencies. Would you, Lena, like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's correct. Um, there, when it comes to, to research, it varies what the age group is included in. There are great exceptions. For example, Karin is leading a, a Swedish national study, which is particularly focusing on the oldest old. But quite often they are excluded. And, and now when it comes to research on the COVID-19 situation, I think a lot of research is quite opportunistic. You do it as quick, as fast as you can. And it's usually a convenience sample, so it's not representative. And when it's done online, that increases the problem of excluding those who are the most frail. So that tends to be the oldest age groups. So that, that is a big problem. And I think we have to really work very hard to make service inclusive of all. Also, also service that are targeted the oldest age group, make sure that they have a good response rate, because if they don't, it's usually biased so that those that are most frail, have cognitive impairments, are dependent in one way or another, are not represented. Thank you, Lena. And uh, this would be a question actually for all of you. Um, what would you raise as important implementation? Uh, what should we all do in practice? Please share ideas on loneliness and alleviation of it. Does anyone want to start or shall I start? You can start, Lena. You can start again. Um, well, as we showed, there, there are very little studies published in the Nordic countries. Unfortunately, that, that is a reflection of what it looks like uh, internationally as well. So we, we don't quite know what is working. And, you know, there is some evidence, but, but not that much. We certainly would like more. But that shouldn't stop us from doing things. We still need to do things, but make sure that you have, think about eval evaluation before you start. Because once you've done the intervention, you can't really evaluate it in a, in a good way. There are lessons uh, from previous overviews that we can uh, learn from. So one is to have a really good coordinator, um, good, well-trained and with the, the power to make decisions around the interventions, to target specific uh, groups and not mix uh, too much. Uh, but also, as, as Lena said, to involve the participants in the planning and the conduction and evaluation of, of the interventions and to build on resources in, in the 
local community. So if there is uh, something going on, build on that rather than starting a competing activity. So those are more general um, tips from, from previous research that seems to increase the chance of succeeding. We have a more specific question about um, physical activities. Uh, uh, one is asking or uh, saying that physical and mental health is intertwined. Uh, but we in the third sector have noticed that it can be difficult for the older adults to engage in physical activities as you get older. Uh, could some kind of nice and funny exercises be the solution like dancing in your chairs or what do you think? I think it is most important that you adapt the physical activities to the group you are working with. And it, maybe it's not need to be so much. And I totally agree when you are bedridden or very frail, it's not like you want to go out for a long walk. But some exercise and maybe also just to be to feeling part of an activity might be enough. But I'm not an expert on, in this area, but I think you should not thinking about long walks or uh, gymnastic exercise can be enough with small activities. Thank you, Karin. And here are actually some questions for you about the ESS. Uh, what time of uh, year was the ESS done? Same time very every year, at least in Finland, it might be different answers in November and June. Oh, I, I do not know. I have no idea. I think it will, it goes on for many months because it's not so easy to to have all people take part at the same time uh, during the year. But I, I have no idea at all. It's probably in the technical reports. You can read it online. And also, is there any reason why Latvia is missing in the overview of the loneliness in the EU, in the ESS? Maybe it, it's the way that they are not part of the ESS survey or they were not taking part the specific years when we when the question about loneliness were included um, so that can be the reason uh, we also have a question are there any interventions focusing mainly on elderly population in agricultural rural areas does anybody have a an answer for that one. I haven't seen anything specific for that group, but I, I'm, I'm sure there must be if you look internationally, but I, I couldn't answer that question. Maybe you can highlight the di digital solutions uh, in that aspect that, um, that they're trying to, to focus a bit on, on those uh, living in, in, in more remote areas. Uh, then we have a question. Uh, what role does accessibility of the built environment play in combating loneliness in the older population, since accessibility can break down barriers for full participation in society? I think I take that one as well then, being an urban planner uh, who has a, a lot of uh, responsibility uh, when, when it comes to, to that question. Uh, we can see in, in the, uh, the study that we did um, last year when it comes to uh, loneliness um, in, in, uh, in the built environment. Uh, that uh, the factor of accessibility is very important. <laughs> so uh, working with spaces that are uh, very including is of course very important. Um, yes. Thank you, Lena. Uh, I think we have one last question. Does loneliness share the same kind of connotation among the Nordic countries? I think that's a very interesting question, but I have to say I haven't seen any research on that. Uh, I mean, loneliness is a subjective experience, a subjective feeling, so it, there will be cultural differences. So, for example, there's 
often assumed, as Karen said, that the Nordic countries, we are individualistic, there's great level of loneliness, but it's actually the other way around. Because we value individualism and independence, we have lower levels of loneliness, whereas in more collective societies, even though they might meet up with their relatives more often, they more often also feel let down and, and uh, experience loneliness. Whether there will be any differences in that respect between the Nordic countries, I have not seen any evidence for that. Mm. Um, but I'm not sure that that's been looked at in detail. But you know, if you compare it to um, like Mediterranean or Central uh, or Eastern European countries, I think Nordic countries are more similar in, in their values. Uh, when they come out in the World Value Survey, for example. But I, I haven't seen any any evidence that there would be any different connotations in these countries. Thank you, Lena, and thank you all for your activities so far. Now back to Jens. Thank you, Jessica. You remember uh, one hour ago we had a, a poll. We asked you what country, what region do you come from? Now I'm really interested to, to see the, the results from the poll. Wow, look here. Thanks, Nina. You can see Sweden, 40%, Finland, 19%, Åland, wow, 16%, Åland Islands, and Denmark, 9, Iceland, 7, Norway, 5, and other countries. I know we have participants from the Baltic uh, countries, from Belgium, for example, also. and. I must say the counting of these votes went uh, smoother than the counting of votes in the United States right, right now. We will now continue with the second part of this webinar. We will hear examples and uh, examples of recent research and also interventions from Finland, Denmark, Norway and Iceland. Four presentations. 15 minutes each and after that questions to our speakers in the second second part so please keep on using the, the chat for discussions and also for questions to the, to the speakers we will start in iceland with the haldor gudmundsson an associate professor of social work from the university of iceland haldor is also general manager of akureyri nursing how? Please, Halder, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good day to you all. And uh, I want to start with uh, giving thanks to my collaborators and the Nordic Welfare Center. It has been a great, uh, great time to, to participate in this project, and, and it has been inspiring for, for us uh, in the research area of loneliness in Iceland. So I hope, hope to, uh, to gain even more proofs than we already have. <clears throat> what I will uh, uh, do with you today is that uh, I want to try to give you a short overview of what we know about the frequency of loneliness in Iceland. I also uh, intend to discuss a little bit about uh, some of those uh, some of those uh, uh, surveys hello is it working yes it's working no thank you and then in the final se se section i want to start to give you some presentation of some of the intervention or maybe the newer intervention that has been going on in Iceland over the last one or two years. Uh, I will start with a little bit of overview of what, I've, what I can find of research in Iceland. As you see in this uh, slide, there is not so very much that we have published in the areas as has been talked about earlier, like Lena and Maria and Lena discussed. Uh, but you see here that it, it has been a growing interest and increasingly uh, increasing numbers of uh, research uh, theses at the university level that is uh, handling and discussing loneliness and boredom among elderly people. And that is, has been growing rather much over the last seven to, to ten years. Uh, in Iceland, we have uh, 
a population-based uh, study that was first uh, started in 2016, uh, sorry, in, in 1999, sorry, and it is uh, done among all Icelanders uh, uh, 60 years, 67 years and older. Uh, according to this research, we have uh, the bigger majority that, uh, that says they are never lonely. 65%. But at the same time, we have somewhere around 70% that say uh, they are sometimes or often lonely. Uh, the development over the years in this survey can be seen here, as presented earlier. Uh, uh, there is a, there seems to be a, a decrease over the years. Uh, and now in the latest survey, we see a, a little bit of increase uh, among uh, of loneliness among uh, older adults in Iceland. Previous research done in 1999 did a, a correlation uh, check on what it was that had the impact on uh, uh, satisfaction, life satisfaction among elderly people, and also what was the correlation of loneliness and dis and satisfaction. As you see in these pictures, there are not necessarily at that time was not necessarily the same factor that was uh, correlated with loneliness and uh, and uh, happiness or or satisfaction of life. So this gives you an overview of what could be the strongest indicator of loneliness. Here it is that you spend too much time by yourself. Uh, in an Icelandic National Health Survey that was done first in 2007 and has been done four times since, we don't have access, not yet, and there has not been published data that I know of, uh, especially for uh, 67 or, or older adults. Uh, but we have a, a frequency of loneliness among uh, Icelanders 18 years and older. And as you see here, there's the loneliness is a little bit higher among females than men, male. And, uh, uh, but uh, it would be very interesting to get a uh, hold of this data and analyze it for, for uh, further, further data, for, further information about the frequency. Uh, then we had a, a international, we have an international uh, project, research project that was uh, done in 2007 and gathered data from self-report and reports from other people, family members, and so on. This was done uh, and, and has not been published uh, data about this uh, regarding loneliness, but it has been published internationally about the structure and statistical power of the research. Uh, in these uh, data sets, we have uh, indication, at least, uh, where we have a one question asking about loneliness, and we have an indication of that uh, somewhere around five to six percent of people over 60 to 90 uh, are saying they are often lonely, but uh, uh, somewhere around uh, 18 percent are saying they are sometimes lonely. Uh, like in the national survey, we have a uh, the, the majority of the people, older adults, are, are not say, not lonely. But the, the interesting thing from my point of view was that in these data sets, and that needs to be analyzed further, according to other research data that we have heard about here today, uh, it seems to be that uh, there is more loneliness among those people that are younger than older people. But like I said, that needs to be researched or analyzed further. Uh, when it comes to intervention in uh, that are focusing primarily on social uh, isolation or loneliness, we have over the last two years been uh, 
setting up uh, a daycare center that has a flexible opening and uh, people applying for daycare are uh, evaluated, especially uh, in light of the loneliness question that we have in our application. Uh, one of the primary focuses is loneliness and, and we have also uh, been having a more discussion in the local community about the consequences of loneliness like we ha have heard here today. Uh, we measure uh, people applying for the daycare center by the cell report and by others, family members. And the interesting thing there is that we have a different uh, perspective from the members, family members and the, the people themselves. When it comes to intervention on a more macro level, we have in Reykjavik an AIDS-friendly city, and we have here in Akureyri over the last 12 months been working on dementia-friendly community. And we have also been in cooperation with the Dementia Association for Iceland, where there is an ongoing project for implementing dementia-friendly societies or communities in uh, more uh, municipalities in Iceland. We have also a policy document like discussed before by Alina uh, in health records and, and, and uh, uh, service plan and action plan for people with dementia. Uh, like I said, uh, in the data set we have now uh, regarding people taking uh, applying for daycare centers or services, we have uh, interesting differences between what family members say about uh, uh, loneliness and what the people, uh, older people themselves, are experiencing. As seen here, it both has to do with uh, family members in in uh, the general sample and also in the in the sample of daycare users. Uh, uh, one of the interventions that we have been applying in elderly care in some of the nursing homes in Iceland is called Eden Alternative Philosophy. Uh, part of that is that you need to evaluate uh, the question, are you lonely or are you experiencing boredom and, uh, or helplessness? And here you see uh, results from uh, three of those surveys done in 2013, 16, and 19. And as you see, we have, uh, again, a different uh, opinion or, or meaning from the elderly themselves living in a nursing home and the uh, family members that has been answering uh, the question. Uh, in general, we have somewhere between uh, 26 to 29 or 30 percent of the population in nursing homes that seems to be lonely, but uh, according to family members, it's somewhere between 16 to 33 uh, percent. We have also in Iceland, uh, Reykjavik community, uh, city of Reykjavik and Akureyri municipality was in cooperation and we got a permission to translate a, a brochure regarding loneliness to just to Distribute, distribute some information about loneliness and, and how to yeah how to react according to a symptom of loneliness and that was published in 2018. Uh, the conclusions from my part seems to be that we have a variability of frequency in Iceland somewhere about 17 to 24 percent for the elderly people, a little bit higher for those living in uh, nursing homes. Uh, we seem to have a lower frequency in national random samples than, uh, than we have experienced. Uh, and we seem to have uh, family members that are more worried about the older adults than the person receiving the service himself. And like I said before, we seems to have a higher 
frequency among younger uh, older adults and older older adults and uh, at the same time with uh, we need to analyze that uh, for some uh, a little bit more uh, and at the final uh, slide uh, we are now uh, supporting different activities by the organization we are supporting in the municipalities and state level uh, uh, activities by organization by uh, run by the adult, adult themselves we have implemented uh, public or health visits by phone and visits to people over 80 uh, or 85 years old and we have implemented daycare services with flexibility where we focus on loneliness and we have this information bullet and we have an increased discussion and research or or uh, thesis uh, discussing loneliness so hopefully we are on the way to focus even more on this area this was what I was supposed to do today, give you a little bit of overview of what is going on in Iceland and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Haldor. And as I said, we will have questions for the speakers after the four presentations we have here in the, in the second part of this webinar. From Iceland to Norway, the following speakers come from Uslomet, Oslo Metropolitan University. It's an honor for me to introduce research professors Maria Artsen and Thomas Hansen. And I think it's Maria who is going to, to start. Please, Maria. Okay. So, uh, yes, my name is Maria Artsen uh, and uh, working at uh, NOVA, Norwegian Social Research. I collaborate with Thomas Hansen. Uh, for this presentation, but also in, in our work on, on the loneliness, we share the same interest in loneliness research um, in, in Norway, but also in Europe. Um, so in my presentation, I give uh, also a short overview of, of research in Norway, in particular scientific research, or actually only scientific research on, uh, on loneliness in the last decade. So I did some uh, research in the databases to see if I could find studies. I think uh, we are rather complete. Maybe I miss one or two, but at least it gives you some impression of, of what's going on in Norway in uh, scientific uh, loneliness research. Um, so we, uh, there are actually quite a number of institutes uh, working every now and then with loneliness. Not very, not very consistently, maybe, but they do uh, interesting work. For example, the National uh, Expertise Center on Aging and Health, Aldering or Health, uh, is uh, doing some research on loneliness. Uh, we have here a high school in Westland, Oslo Met, the university in uh, in Oslo. Uh, also, Statistics Norway has done some work on loneliness, the University of Southern East, Southeastern Norway, University of Oslo, University of Bergen, and here is the symbol or the logo for NOVA, Norwegian Social Research, where we work. Um, the, 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 the focus of these studies are, are quite broad, but all in all, uh, they give, I think, some nice uh, findings uh, on, on loneliness research. For example, University of Southeast Norway have published a study on correlates of loneliness, or maybe we could call it the risk factors or outcomes. It's correlates because it's only one time point, so we do not know precisely what is cause and effect, but anyway, this uh, study focused on, on factors that are as associated with loneliness. Researchers involved are Heidi Ormstad, Greta Eilertsen, and Leif Zandwijk. University of Bergen uh, has done studies on uh, emotional loneliness. Lena has explained in her presentation already that this is slightly different from social loneliness. It's especially missing an intimidated other person, an intimidated person or a partner. Uh, so emotional loneliness in nursing home residents. Uh, this was done by researchers Dragaset, Aida and Ramhoff. And here at the high school uh, of Westland, we had um, a study on loneliness as a risk factor for metabolic syndrome. 
that is uh, interesting because it's not so often done, but uh, there is a reason for that. You could think that people could uh, start eating when they are feeling lonely and these kind of things. The researchers here are Hendrickson, Nielsen and Stromberg. Um, here are the, uh, the, the Expertise Center for Aging and Health that has done a number of studies on loneliness, uh, one on mastery, impairments and loneliness, one on friendships and loneliness, an interesting study there. Uh, one on also on the prevalence of loneliness in, in Norway and uh, a longitudinal study on developments in uh, loneliness. Researchers there were McNeil, Nikolaisen and Torchen. Statistics Norway has done a research on loneliness as a sort of indicator or marker of quality of life. Anders Barsta was there, the researcher. And then at the University of Oslo, Department for Nursing and Health Sciences have done two studies, as far as we know of. One on the subjective experience of loneliness and one on the burden of loneliness. Researchers there are Hauge, Hauge and Chirkvold. Uh, the other faculty of uh, the University of Oslo, Department of Psychology, has done a study on five-year developments in loneliness with as main researcher there, Tilman von Soest. And then at the Department of Social Work of OsloMet, the, uh, this is a department uh, focusing more on, on application of, of solutions to reduce, uh, for example, loneliness. So here we have a study on loneliness in relations to loneliness technologies. I think Thomas will say maybe a few words on, on the technology that was central here. Uh, main researchers there are Marit Haldar and uh, Rasmussen. And then uh, our own research uh, of the Norwegian Social Research is, has been focusing on cross-national comparisons. So where we find, where we compare different countries, European countries, um, uh, one study on loneliness as mediator, or in other words, uh, loneliness is as a pathway from uh, some, some uh, in this case, socioeconomic uh, position to health outcomes. So the question was, is, is uh, a higher socioeconomic position associated with less loneliness and therefore with better health? That was more or less the focus there. We also did some uh, latent uh, trajectories analysis on loneliness and uh, focusing now, the focus is mainly on social exclusion and loneliness. And it's mainly me and uh, Thomas working there. So some findings um, from the studies that I now presented so far. So uh, the first was maybe um, the one that I mentioned that uh, loneliness is a risk factor for metabolic syndrome. This is not so very, very often found. So it's an interesting finding, an interesting and worth to, to, to work further on, I think. Another was that loneliness is a mediator between stress and sleep quality. So people who are stressed are more lonely and therefore have lower sleep quality. Um, loneliness also seen as a mediator between uh, socioeconomic position and health. I already explained that one. Um, Emotional loneliness associated with increased mortality. So people who are emotionally lonely have died earlier than those who are do not experience emotional loneliness. And then this is not new either after the previous presentation that loneliness prevalence varies from 30 to 55% in Eastern European countries and 10 to 20% in Western and Northern European countries. And so Nordic countries are doing relatively well, you could say, with respect to, to loneliness. Um, and this, this, no, no, I don't. So uh, I want to interrupt myself, but I don't. Um, so and then lonely and, lonely and not lonely people define loneliness differently. I think that's an in other interesting finding. So uh, loneliness still, uh, I think we come to that uh, all the time. Loneliness is something subjectively. We cannot say you are a lonely person. We could say you are socially isolated in an objective situation, but we cannot answer the question for other people whether or not they are lonely. And here it seems that people who are lonely define low, what is loneliness in a different way than those who do not feel lonely. Interesting maybe also for us uh, who on, generally, on general may be not so feeling, not so lonely. 
feeling of mastery is important. Many studies find uh, that those who have uh, high levels of mastery, which means that they feel in control of their life, uh, they are more able to sort of avoid loneliness or, or, or sort of, I don't know, combat loneliness or um, something like that. Uh, and then the study found that the dissatisfaction with friends is related to loneliness. So even though you have friends, but if the friends are disappointing in a way, then um, it would um, increase loneliness. And then gender moderates, which means that the association between personality and loneliness is different for men and women. Stronger for men than women, uh, the association. Actually, I don't know. I have to, uh, I have to read the study again. But uh, uh, nevertheless, the association between personality and loneliness is different for men and women. And then finally, uh, emotional stability and extroversion, also to psychological traits or, or how to call it, um, is related to less loneliness and steeper loneliness decline. So um, not too bad, I would say, over the last 10 years. Uh, on the other hand, there's also some reason for concern because uh, it seems that loneliness research, despite all the nice initiatives, still is rather incidental and spread across different research institutes. Um, so substantial knowledge of the drivers of loneliness is essential for science and the development of loneliness intervention. So we could, I think, benefit from an even more coordinated approach to loneliness research and loneliness interventions. And the dissemination of knowledge in teaching programs would be a good step in the right direction. So I also think that this meeting today is a very nice, um, very, very good way to, to, to come to a more coordinated approach. And now I give the floor to Thomas, or oh, now the screen to Thomas. Thanks, Maria. Um, let me see if this works. Um, there we are. So my name is uh, Thomas Hansen. I work together with Maria at Oslo Met University in Oslo. I also work at, um, at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health in Oslo. So um, I want to talk about interventions to reduce social isolation and loneliness in Norway. Um, Lena and Karin has already shown in their report that there's really not much done. They didn't find a single study on this in Norway. And, and my own uh, search sort of agrees. But uh, nonetheless, I found some, uh, some, at least some relevant examples or uh, relevant initiatives. Um, so first, the Bowen study show it's a randomized control trial of senior uh, of a senior center, where they have this group program for increasing social support and preventing depression. It's a small sample, 91 persons, and uh, these were people who reported being lonely. They, they were in the intervention group. So the intervention was a three-hour group meetings, and uh, outcome variables were depression, life satisfaction, and social support, which is the most relevant factor here. And they did find some small beneficial effects, but uh, perhaps due to the small sample size, it was not significant. Um, a different initiative was uh, one carried out in Bayern municipality outside of Oslo, uh, which uh, emphasizes very much joint meals, social activities and emotional support, and uh, also intergenerational contact that we know can be quite important for, uh, for combating uh, loneliness. Um, they didn't have an effect, any effect measures, so you can't really study these effects very well. But um, anyway, these results are presented in this report. Um, and the participants were very happy about the initiative. So that sort of uh, gives some uh, uh, validity to the conclusion that it actually works. They have, for example, these uh, meetings where they watched the uh, World Cup uh, together and had some meals together. Uh, they also had these meals, uh, joint meals at the senior center. Uh, and the, uh, as I said, people were very happy about uh, these uh, meetings. Um, something else is, of course, the Red Cross initiatives, where they have these visiting friends, where people uh, visit uh, older people. And also you can join up to become an activity friend, which is uh, uh, helping older people with dementia. 
Um, the thing is that during the COVID situation, these uh, are these initiatives are largely down actually at the moment. So it's it's very sad uh, in that respect. I spoke to the the uh, volunteer center in Oslo the other day, and they said that uh, these while these things are really down at the moment, what's what's sort of increasing is a telephone friend. So so people are increasingly uh, volunteering to become telephone friends. So that's a really nice initiative. Other thing is this uh, this digital. Uh, we know that the barrier for uh, for use among older people is um, is uh, uh, having the experience and the know how to use these things. And uh, there are some uh, really user friendly uh, technologies that's developed by this company called No Isolation. That's uh, been very quite got some attention in the media lately, and it's. Uh, it has gotten really good reviews from the users. Also, our own institute at Oslo Met uh, might have mentioned the technologies they develop, and it's and it's actually uh, it actually came out the other day that they have this new um, uh, developed uh, technology that's very simple to use, whereby they have they have this uh, sort of magnet that you can attach to a cup, and then you can put the cup on top of these signs where you can. See, go through your contacts, you can make a call, uh, you can log on and off, etc. So it's very easy to use. Uh, so that's another really useful initiative, I think. Uh, and it's meant for, uh, particularly for uh, very old people and people with uh, cognitive uh, disabilities, dementia, etc. So, well, uh, that's um, at least some useful examples of really nice initiatives, I think. Okay, thanks. I'll see if I can stop sharing now, stop share. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Maria, also. We will now tackle today's questions from another angle. Dominik Hauderovich is running a multidisciplinary architectural studio. Dominik is especially interested in age, inclusion, and the social potentials of architecture. From Denmark, the architect Dominik Hauderovich. Yes, hello, thank you. Thank you everyone for some interesting presentations. Um, I will say a few words about uh, our own work uh, here. Um, and let me share my screen to a full screen. Yes, and um, so I will be giving just a broad overview of uh, some of the themes that we are interested in. As uh, was mentioned, I'm an architect and partner in the um, uh, uh, architectural studio Dominique Plus Serena. Um, and we have been working on uh, age-inclusive public spaces uh, over the last years. Um, and I think uh, even though it, this comes from a slightly different angle than, than the, the research that has been presented today, I think this uh, is a very important field and very much underexplored field. And that is um, the question of how the public space and the built environment in general can uh, contribute to, to an inclusive society. And especially the public space is a space that mediates um, contacts, also serendipitous meetings between strangers uh, it's the space where local communities can uh, can be built um, so so this has been a key interest of ours um, we have recently published this book called uh, age inclusive public space where we have invited uh, researchers um, and uh, contributors from a variety of, uh, of disciplines to write original contributions that we have tried to, um, to translate and contextualize to be uh, meaningful to work with uh, for spatial practitioners. So this is very much a joint effort uh, and we are very interested in this duality between the theoretical work that is to be found in the academic uh, disciplines and how that knowledge can be translated into the built environment and uh, the book mainly focuses on on two themes and these are the themes of agency and belonging so one would be focused on uh, this 
uh, how the built environment can um, can facilitate autonomous living, um, the 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 and provide a sense of agency, and the other one is uh, belonging and how the built environment can uh, facilitate social contacts, meeting opportunities, etc. Uh, so one could say that one of our key questions would be how to create and enhance life quality, uh, quality for the elderly in the built environment. Um, and this is not to say that we are interested in building cities or places that focus on the elderly specifically uh, or exclusively, but to say that a built environment that is that uses the elderly as an impetus or an inspiration for, uh, for um, design and creation, um, it will generally be an, an environment that is uh, better for everyone. Um, and uh, we know from the, the research that we have gathered and uh, the contributions uh, to the book, that there are a series of um, factors that uh, can be influenced by or that can be considered uh, when working in, with, uh, with spaces, architecture, urban planning and design. So this also span uh, multiple categories. Um, one of these uh, is one that we're focusing on today, loneliness and social isolation. Um, but the built environment also uh, has um, influence on the possibility of intergenerational contact. How can it be facilitated? Physical activity and outdoor activities. Um, and as earlier mentioned, these of course also have uh, consequences for mental health. Um, a stigmatization environment speaks to and about certain user groups. Um, uh, it has influence on uh, the possibility of participation in local community and in public life. This kind of uh, understanding of oneself as a participant in a civic uh, society. Uh, and um, of course, this question of identity and continuity over the life course. So how spaces that, um, that you can uh, continue to live in are important uh, for the way that you understand yourself um, and these uh, um, breaks, for instance, uh, when you need to relocate to uh, care facilities, how that uh, constitutes also um, a, a physical uh, and mental uh, change in your life that can be uh, perceived quite traumatically. Um, in our work, we have uh, focused on um, a, uh, uh, a few um, key spaces um, that are important uh, that we have defined ourselves. And of course, I will say <laughs> also in this context, we are not academic uh, researchers. Uh, we are interested in space. So, so these are the categories that we have defined as being important uh, when working within this theme. So uh, one key space we find we would be the threshold and this is the, to be understood in the broadest uh, sense possible between the indoor and outdoor environments, between the public and the private environments. Um, and I think that is especially true uh, when working, for instance, with welfare institutions, how these uh, thresholds can spatially be negotiated, how uh, here you can see some examples, uh, actually quite old ones from the 70s, uh, from the Dutch architect Hermann Herzberger, in um, how you can articulate spaces around the door frame, this idea of the half door that is something that allows for um, um, social contact with the neighbors or acquaintances coming by without you needing to leave your personal space um, and, and being sheltered uh, within the private realm of your house. Um, this could be infrastructural spaces such as uh, landings and stairs uh, close to, to uh, home environments. Um, then the immediate living environment, the spaces that are closest to home, um, that also provide a sense of this kind of local community and the sense of neighborhood. And there, of course, are also a variety of spatial considerations uh, for how the space can be designed and negotiated so that it actually creates these possibilities for, for encounters. 
uh, one interesting example is, uh, for instance, this one from the um, uh, um, public housing project called Edificio 111 uh, by the Spanish architects Flores and Prats, that, for instance, provide an elevator that doesn't go all the way down to the parking uh, spaces that are um, beneath the ground floor, but make an elevator that goes to the courtyard level where you need to cross the courtyard and then go down uh, into the parking space. And this, of course, might be trivial uh, to some, but these are the kinds of um, uh, architectural tools, one could say, that can be deployed in creating opportunities for meetings, creating opportunities for neighbors to meet, meet each other. We're quite interested in this notion of elasticity and how the, um, how the built environment can answer to um, varying needs according to personal competences. Um, and then, of course, there is the, the idea of the city as a whole. How can public spaces within the city uh, be planned um, in a more age-inclusive way? Um, where are public spaces located? How can they be accessed? But also then um, on the, the scale of design, how are the spaces designed and benches designed, etc., so that they, they actually function, so they can be used by everyone. For our own work, we have been experimenting a little bit uh, with um, uh, participation, trying to figure out if there are ways in which um, architects and planners uh, and communities, a commu communal level um, uh, engagement can, um, can try to include also elderly um, citizens in the processes. So in one of the case studies that we have done, uh, we, for instance, tried to especially seek out uh, different parts of the elderly population, um, both elderly living at home, um, where we went on home visits and did interviews, um, people that lived in assisted housing, uh, where we could um, um, reach out to them through home carers, where we all were also able to go on home visits and, and try to get a sense of the everyday life of these kind of different groups of citizens. And at last, we also actually had um, a workshop at a local nursing home. In this um, case in particular, this was relevant because the, the nursing home that we went to visit was right adjacent to the site that we're going to develop. So I think there is a lot of interesting work to be done uh, and developed on how participation methods can be um, uh, created and developed in a more age-inclusive way. Um, and we got a pretty good sense of that these people, even though they they had not been heard in, in earlier participatory processes, had a, a lot to say about uh, the developments that were nearby them. Um, for instance, using their, um, their local supermarket as a, um, a daily um, um, event of socialization and of exercise. And this, I think, is key to understanding this everyday life that takes place in, in all kinds of different neighborhoods is key to really develop spaces that matter um, to this group. Um, and I think I'm going to go quite fast through this, but there are some uh, elements that um, prove important. Uh, as I say, the right location for developments in this uh, case study, there was this nursing home here and assisted senior housing here and the local supermarket here. And what we wanted to do is kind of develop a public square uh, that would allow for the social contact that was already taking place um, in this community to have a space to unfold. Um, and location, I think, is, is key uh, importance. Um, especially when you work in the built environment, it is often practicalities that decide, for instance, what kind of spaces are being developed. In this case, it was um, there was a planned development for, for this space behind here that was actually out of reach and out of the walking lines of the, the elderly that were living in this community. And by being able to propose um, a land swap, we were able to, to, to develop um, this kind of central uh, space and within the design trying to consider that not all kinds of people have the same uh, social um, initiative 
um, wanted to provide, even though this is a quite small development, um, spaces that were close to the entrance of the supermarket for people that wanted to come in contact with uh, with others, come to sit here so that they could just say hello when someone walks by, but also provide other kinds of opportunities to observe a little bit from a distance uh, what was going on. So I think there are many of these, these kinds of considerations that are quite subtle, but that we can also see when re revisiting this place now that they actually make a difference. Um, and there are some questions and considerations of how to, to design in a way that is comfortable uh, also for elderly people to use, but in a way that is not exclusively talking to one uh, user group, but how you can de design in a polyvalent way so that um, the landscapes or the, the objects you design also relate to other user groups. Um, you, this is a, so just a small photo um, of this man ex, uh, coming out of the supermarket and hanging out and then meeting some people. And I, I think um, this, this, these are trivial meetings, um, but if you're someone that is isolated or do, do not have many public encounters uh, during a day, I think it's um, providing an opportunity like this is, um, is a way forward. Uh, providing opportunities for play, incentivizing, uh, jumping, running, playing around, not by creating playgrounds, but by, by integrating opportunities for play in the design um, and creating atmospheres, focusing maybe on multi-sensory experiences in, in the design. Uh, we have found very interesting um, smells, uh, reminiscent uh, uh, plants, reminiscent of different kinds of landscapes, colors um, changing with the seasons, etc. So I think there are many um, interesting uh, things to, to, to work with here and we are ourselves uh, trying to continue to work on different scales on um, the age inclusive city, the city as a whole, um, how living environments can be made more inclusive and if there are new opportunities for care um, that is different and differently spatially organized. So these are the things that we for hopefully will be looking into um, over the next year. Yeah, thank you. There were my words here. Thank you very, very much, Dominique. Really, really interesting stuff you had you had there. Now, last but absolutely not least, we're going to hear about a recent study from Finland. It's a study about loneliness in long-term care facil facilities. Anu Jansson is the woman behind the study. She's a manager at the Finnish Association for the Welfare of Older People. Please, Anu. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure and honor to be here. I like try to share the screen here. So there we go. Uh, <clears throat> so I uh, truly work in the Finnish Association for the Welfare of Older People, and and my work there is uh, to alleviate loneliness of older people and promote. Uh, welfare of them. We do uh, group models, circle of friends, and self-management activities in Finland. And my perspective, my subject uh, today is loneliness of older people in long-term care facilities. And let's start with this. Like we have already heard from many, uh, we may say that loneliness uh, has a poor health forecast among all the people, truly. And despite this information, loneliness in long-term care facilities uh, has received too little attention. Loneliness may be even more prevalent among the older people in long-term care facilities than in communities. Uh, those uh, in the facilities who are lonely, maybe not isolated uh, from each other, but uh, they are lonely in a crowd. 
Mostly residents in facilities live side by side, we know that, uh, but not with meaning for others. It seems that lonely residents live physically close, but mentally distant. The aim of this study, this was also um, aim of my thesis, PhD thesis, uh, was to explore loneliness in long-term care facilities in Helsinki, Finland, its prevalence, associated factors and uh, prognosis, as well as temporal trends over time. Uh, the aim also included exploration of how uh, loneliness was experienced and expressed by older people in these facilities. The aim also was um, to assess the effectiveness of group intervention process among lonely residents in these facilities. And very shortly, <laughs> material and methods. Uh, in, in this uh, study, I used uh, both quantitative and qualitative methods. Uh, they were complementing each other uh, to explore loneliness. Uh, Cross-sectional interviews and assessments among residents in Helsinki long-term care facilities explored the prevalence of loneliness and its associated factors and prognosis. And repeated cross-sectional interviews and assessments were used to explore the temporal trends of loneliness. And we asked uh, uh, the question, do you suffer from loneliness? Uh, in both quantitative studies, uh, participants with severe dementia were excluded. And the qualitative part, qualitative studies involved six cognitively impaired participants and seven cognitively intact participants. And in these qualitative studies, we had a, a multi-method approach leaning on ethnographic outlook. And then uh, some main results, quite shortly also these. Like we see, over one third uh, of the respondents suffered from loneliness at least sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there was no change uh, in the prevalence of loneliness over time. Propensity score adjusted loneliness was 36% in 2011 and 17. <clears throat> and then loneliness was associated uh, with poor self-rated health dependency in activities of daily living and mobility, higher cognitive function and poor psychological well-being, and loneliness predicted mortality. And like in Lena Dahlberg's uh, fine presentation, mental health is a strong factor. Feeling depressed was the only independent variable associated with loneliness in multivariate logistic regression model. The prevalence of loneliness among respondents feeling depressed was uh, 55% and among those not feeling depressed, it was 24%. And then about this uh, qualitative part of the study, I think it was the heart of the study. It uh, gave a voice to older people who suffered from loneliness and described their experiences. Loneliness proved to be uh, a severe and unique experience, which encored in time and location of the long-term care facilities. The respondents described loneliness in very va varied ways, ways, richly, also using many metaphors. Like here, I never get over the fence 
that prevents me from being in contact with others. And loneliness was also uh, time dependent in many ways. Uh, the respondents uh, had an experience of an empty, lonely life and constant waiting. They had a variety of uh, different activities uh, and a group meetings every week, almost every day. But loneliness was still very much present in their daily life. Loneliness varied according to seasons, days of the week, and daily hours. Uh, time also alleviated loneliness. Uh, it helped a person to cope with loneliness. For example, Lars described how I be so engaged with loneliness that I'm used to it. But for many, many respondents, life was uh, waiting for something like here. I'm wait waiting for the priest. The priest visits me once a week. She won't be here tonight, but I still set the table ready. Loneliness was also place dependent in many ways. The respondents never used meaning of home when they told about their apartments. They use, uh, used hospital, prison, a marketplace, but never, never even accidentally home. These uh, expressions uh, revealed how loneliness was shaped by the environment in which they lived. The lonely respondents in the facilities seemed to be uh, bystanders in their own lives. Uh, hospital and marketplace experiences were related to lack of privacy in their own lives. They also felt uh, invisible in the houses. When no, one's pay, no, pay, no one pays attention to me, I disappear. Respondents described how they spent long periods in their rooms without being to get out. This was re uh, related to prison expression. Then uh, some words um, of good Nordic intervention based on randomized control trial. A facilitated uh, circle of friends group process with clear steps, meaningful activities and, and good interaction were important and warmly pushed uh, lonely older people to undertake group work despite frailty and cognitive impairment in some. Loneliness was reflected and ventilated with peers in many ways. The goal-oriented group made participants' ex expectations visible. The group empowered the participants to more independent meetings and uh, facilitators actually had possibility to take steps back so that the group could continue with their own. <clears throat> then a uh, very short take home message. Loneliness uh, is common and it, it has also a bad forecast for residents in long term care facilities. It is uh, related to health, well being and mortality. Uh, please ask about loneliness and document the experiences in long-term care facilities. It is very, very important. And also please use <laughs> effective interventions. We have them. And I think uh, that among older people in long-term care facilities, there are two life events that are really close in the past and in the future, in the life course of older people. And they are moving from a real home to care facility and approaching death. It is obvious uh, that the time between should be made as good as possible. And older people in the long-term care facilities are worth it. And then, uh, 
I want to show uh, one uh, example of uh, how we alleviate loneliness in Finland. This is a circle of friends and uh, loneliness in a nutshell. <laughs> Iäkkäiden ihmisten yksinäisyys on yleistä, mutta yksinäisyyden kokemusten monimuotoisuutta ja henkilökohtaisuutta ei aina ymmärretä oikein. Yksi viihtyy omissa oloissaan hyvin, kun taas joku toinen kärsii yksinäisyydestä, vaikka rientääkin harrastuksesta toiseen. Yksinäisyys ei välttämättä näy päällepäin. Asia selviää vain kysymällä henkilöltä itseltään, keskustelemalla ja kuuntelemalla. Vanhustyön keskusliiton ystäväpiiritoiminta on tutkitusti toimiva lääke yksinäisyyden lievittämiseen. Ohjattujen ystäväpiiriryhmien tärkein voimavara ovat iäkkäät ihmiset itse. Osallistujiensa näköiseksi muovautuvassa ryhmässä syntyy välittämistä, huumoria ja ystävyyttä, joka saa aikaan ainutlaatuisia asioita. Vertaistuen hyödyt ovat pitkäkestoisia, sillä osallistujista yli puolet jatkaa yhteydenpitoa omatoimisesti kolme kuukautta kestävän ohjatun vaiheen jälkeen. Uusia ystäviä voi saada vielä vanhanakin. Koulutetut ystäväpiiriohjaajat tekevät hyvää tavoitteellista työtä ympäri maata. Katso lisää ystäväpiiritoiminnasta osoitteesta vtkl.fi kautta ystäväpiiri. Thank you so much and, and keep safe all. Thank you, Anu. Impressing work and also impressing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Now, dear audience, questions for Anu, questions for Haldor, for Maria, Tumas, and Dominique. How is it, Jessica, with the chat and questions? Do we have? Any questions for the speakers? Yes, we have a lot of questions. Uh, I love this activity. Thank you, Jens, for asking. We will start off with a question for Haldor. Uh, what characterizes a dementia-friendly community? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, if we just uh, we have based our uh, work of uh, dementia community on work from the World Health Organization and the Alzheimer Organization in Britain, I can show you uh, a short uh, picture of what the elements are, just by presenting it here. It uh, has to do with the communities, organization, and partnership, and we are trying to achieve inclusion work against stigma, increase awareness in the society and improve care and services. So that are the elements and, and I will uh, link this into my slide so you can see it. Sounds Hope great, please. thank you Haldor. Uh, then we have a question for Maria. Uh, you discussed that lonely people define loneliness differently compared to people who are not lonely. In what way does this differ? Yes, yes. Uh, well, actually, it's not my finding. So in the chat box, I already re uh, gave the full reference to people who want to read the whole study. But in short, it, it uh, shows that um, in my own words, uh, both lonely and non not lonely people describe loneliness as being a painful situation. But then the people differ, the two groups differ with respect to who they blame, so to say, for the loneliness. So the not lonely people tend to sort of blame the lonely people themselves. So they should maybe uh, try some better ways to get out of the negative situation or, uh, so, so in a way they see the solution in the lonely people themselves. They should pull themselves out of the lonely situation. Whereas the people who are lonely, they, they are uh, much more detailed in their opinion or of where loneliness comes from for example they they of course they say sometimes maybe it's myself uh, so i'm the one who to be blamed here but they very often mention also many other things uh, for example lack of social support uh, lack of contact with important others so it's not only uh, them to blame in in the eye of the uh, of the lonely person themselves 
Thank you, Maria. And we will also send out the links that have been posted in the chat, so, so for further reading. Uh, then we have a question for Dominique. Uh, as most people prefer to age in the comfort of their own home, do you think the knowledge of age-inclusive public spaces can also be translated to or integrated in age-inclusive housing? Uh, yes, I um, think that's a very good question and I think also one that we consider a lot. Um, I think um, uh, throughout the Nordic countries actually there is this policy of, of uh, uh, aging in place, um, uh, staying in the, the home environment um, as a long time, as long time as possible. But I think um, the questions that we are raising is is the housing that we have currently also especially housing for the elderly suited for that kind of policy in general as maybe um, the way that it is designed it functions very well uh, also in old age with impaired mobility etc but it doesn't function in a social context as it doesn't relate to its wider community there is uh, often it functions as an island separate from other activities and other spaces within the city so i think that is a key consideration for creating uh, age inclusive uh, environments and housing in the future Thank you, Dominique. And then there is a question for all, I think. Uh, is there any available research on loneliness among older adults and minorities, like Sami people, language minorities, etc.? Not that I know of. No, no. Me, neither. no. me neither. No, me neither. All right, that probably says it all. <laughs> uh, and another question to everybody. Um, I don't recall anyone talking about loneliness and feelings of shame. To what extent is this a problem when researching loneliness? Different levels of feeling ashamed of being lonely among different generations, for example. I can uh, answer this. In my longitudinal uh, qualitative study, I made interviews and in the first round, these people, half of them, they didn't want to express or tell about their own loneliness. They told about others, and uh, but not their own. And I think this was a little bit uh, related to the shame of them. But, but then when the uh, research continued and they felt safe, and relaxed and they also know me knew me better so then they admit uh, more this loneliness and until uh, told this loneliness more thank you anu and we have one last question for you actually what is the age of the longest lived in your long term nursing home does loneliness increase as time lived in nursing home increase uh, sorry, could you repeat that question very easily? Yes, what is the age of the longest lived in your long-term nursing home? Does loneliness increase as time lived in nursing home increase? Ah, it was not related to this uh, living time in nursing home. No, it, it was uh, a result of my study. Yes, good, very good question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Then I would like to finish off with a comment from Sweden, which I think provides a good example for combating loneliness. Uh, in Sweden, Umeå, they have started a research project about social prescribing. One primary care unit is starting to prescribe social activities to patients. The social activities are then performed in the third sector or in the community. Yes, thank you. Back to you, Jens. Thank you, Jessica, and a very good comment from Umeå there. You remember we started this a couple of hours ago with a couple of words from the organizer of this webinar, Ayla Mätä. Ayla is now also going to make a couple of closing remarks. Please go ahead, Ayla. Yes, thank you. Uh, and, and we hope uh, really that uh, this Nordic knowledge can inspire everyone who was working with these issues every day uh, and this is of course as many have told before very current and important field because of the co ongoing corona pandemic and there is a really need of action and 
and uh, finding a new solutions for reaching those older adults who are now more socially isolated because of the pandemic. And Nordic Welfare Center want to thank our presenters, uh, members of our expert group, and our global audience, and of course your moderator Jens, and I will also thank my colleagues from Nordic Welfare Center for an excellent work today we have done together. So thank you, all of you. Yes, and the biggest thank, thank you goes to, to you, Ayla. Uh, we know all that life expectancy has increased four to five years since the 1990s. The Nordic region expects an increased elderly population in both the short and the long term, which means that senior individuals, older adults, will make up an increasing part of the Nordic population. Therefore, these questions that we have discussed today will get more and more important every day. So this is an area where the discussion will accelerate, I think. But now, thank you all for participating in this webinar. Thank you also for being so active in, in the chat with questions and uh, comments and, and so on. But now you all take care, stay healthy. See you another time. Bye for now. <laughs>